Well, good day. Um, thank you very much for listening to what I've got to say. And I might also uh, offer my thanks uh, if there are any shareholders or representatives of shareholders in Finsbury Growth and Income Trust listening to what I've got to say. I'd like to thank them for their patience because as you can see from the uh, table of investment returns on the slide, you can see that I am hmm, just emerging from a back-to-back -back two year period of underperforming our benchmark. Now, mercifully, as you can also see, mercifully, that hasn't happened so often during the 22 years and counting of our responsibility for Finsbury's investment affairs. I can assure you, though, uh, that it was deeply disagreeable, that period of underperformance. Now, it may be, it may be that Finsbury's investment performance has improved somewhat over the last few months. And I sincerely hope, of course, that it has. If our performance has improved, though, it is not as the result of any changes really to the portfolio and certainly not to the strategy. Investment turnover, portfolio turnover, remains extremely low by the standards of the investment trust industry. And just pragmatically conveying to you that low level of turnover, let me point out that it's now three years and counting since we last introduced any new names to the portfolio. Uh, back in the first half of 2020, we initiated in Experian and Fever Tree, both of which I still regard as absolutely archetypal holdings uh, for this strategy, but nothing new since then. Now, moving to the portfolio itself, I'd also like you to acknowledge something else that hasn't changed. And that is that Finsbury's portfolio remains extremely concentrated, as it always has done. Today, there are 19 holdings only. And if you run a strategy as concentrated as this one, you really, really need to make sure that you're concentrated on the right things. And as those of you who've heard me before, you will know that it's our contention that the portfolio is indeed concentrated, but concentrated on a collection of what we believe to be outstanding businesses, predominantly UK companies, as is appropriate given that this is a UK equity mandate. Now, I also hope that this box that you can see uh, on the screen is also helpful to you, uh, helpful at least in uh, indicating what the thematic effects are that we're looking to capture uh, from Finsbury's portfolio. So as you can see, over 40% of the NAV is invested in what we call 
digital winners. That is companies doing smart things with data, analytics, or software. Companies like Experian. We've then got another big allocation to companies that own luxury, or at the very least, truly premium consumer brands, like Fevertree, for instance. There is then a smaller but still important allocation to companies that own mass market consumer brands, but that are beloved mass market consumer brands that offer pricing power. Then the smallest proportion of Finsbury's portfolio is exposed to actually what I imagine will be the industry that many of you who are listening to me here will be employed in. Uh, we have two or three holdings in companies in the provision of private wealth investment management services in the UK. And I sincerely hope that all of you employed in that industry are optimistic about the businesses that you work for and optimistic about your own careers. Personally, I think that you, you should be. Now, with this next slide, um, I, I want to show you uh, another perspective on the investment performance of Finsbury Growth and Income Trust since our appointment back in late 2000. And I hope you won't feel that what I'm about to discuss with you is either irrelevant or even, in a way, impertinent. But let me explain what I mean. What you're looking at here is the share price total return on Finsbury since the back end of 2000 compared to the S&P 500, the US stock market, of course, expressed in sterling. And as you can see, Finsbury has not only, as I alluded to earlier, over time outperformed the UK stock market, it's actually outperformed the S&P 500 as well. Now, I share that with you, not just because I'm hopelessly needy and want to try and impress you, fat chance I have with a, of that with an audience like this, but I, I do want to make two points about what you're looking at here. The first is to submit to you that sometimes, perhaps even for much of the time, the investment approach, the investment principles being followed are as important for investment returns as the geographic allocation. In other words, what I'm saying is that the investment approach for Finsbury, which I've just kind of outlined to you, of running a highly concentrated portfolio, concentrated on excellent businesses held for the long term, that investment approach evidently has generated returns that are globally competitive over time, despite the fact that Finsbury has been predominantly investing in a stock market, the UK, that's been actually somewhat disappointing uh, uh, over the last uh, 20 years and definitely latterly has been really out of favour. And then secondly, and I suppose associated with that first point, what I'd also like to convey is that what this slide says to me is that 
contrary to common perception, contrary to that perception, there are in fact a number, a fair few indeed, really outstanding companies quoted on the London stock market that have been able to deliver perfectly satisfactory returns for investors over time. So let's have a look at some of those outstanding companies quoted on the UK stock market, at least ones that we own uh, in Finsbury. And I'm going to begin with the biggest single holding that we have in the trust today, which is Relex. Now, in our view, Relex's proprietary data sets and its proprietary algorithms make this company one of the finest growth businesses anywhere around the world. It just so happens that Relex has its listing on the London stock market. Oh, we're lucky <laughs> that it's listed on the, stock, the London stock market because this is a globally significant business. And I think you'd agree, looking at the chart that I've put up here, any company, as Relix has done, any company that during the course to date of the 21st century, any company that's been able to outperform not just the FT All Share Index, I think the All Share has sort of doubled, just about doubled in its total return over that period, also has outperformed the S&P 500. But critically, as we're showing you here, during the course of the 21st century, Relex has actually outperformed NASDAQ as well in sterling terms. Any business that can do that, well, there's something of real and long-lasting value creation going on in a, a business that can deliver those sorts of returns. Now, we've been invested in Relex for much of the last two decades. And, you know, I can't remember a time when the pessimists, when the pessimists weren't worrying that technology would eat Relex's lunch, specifically that Google would disintermediate Relex. Well, clearly that hasn't happened. And by analogy, I have to say, we expect that current concerns about the competitive threat of artificial intelligence for Relex's business, we expect those concerns to prove groundless, prove groundless as well. Uh, there was a, I, I thought a great, um, a great quote in the White Times, uh, maybe a fortnight ago now, from a Silicon Valley chief executive. The company, I think, is Signal. Uh, and the chief executive of Signal is clearly a bit of a sceptic about artificial intelligence. What she was quoted as saying was this. She said that relying on artificial intelligence is like taking advice from your ill-informed drunk uncle. Well, if you are a customer of Relex, if you're a scientist, a lawyer, a risk professional, working on career critical projects, then you absolutely can't rely on your ill-informed drunk uncle. No, we absolutely concur with Nick Luff, 
the finance director of Relex. You can see him quoted on this slide earlier this year, saying that in fact, the acceleration in Relex's business over the last 18 months is actually being driven by AI. Far from it being a threat, it's an opportunity. So here is Relex. It's a substantive company. It's the 11th biggest company in the FTSE 100. Um, it's winning with technology. And to us, we absolutely see no reason why Relex's best decades shouldn't be still to come. And I have to say that that's our expectation as well for the company on my next slide. The London Stock Exchange Group. And of course, the LSE is another London listed company doing smart things with data and analytics. It's also, as you can see on the slide that we're showing you here, it's also another of these London listed companies that over a meaningful time period has also done better than NASDAQ. And that's despite the fact that the LSE is well over 300 years old. You don't necessarily have to take the risk of investing in novelty in order to generate very, very satisfactory long term total returns. Now, I show you this slide um, in part because I want to reinforce to you the reason why Microsoft has chosen to enter into a really quite a significant and meaningful joint venture with the London Stock Exchange Group. You'll recall this JV was announced last December, and I've just shown you on the slide a quote from a senior officer at Microsoft outlining what Microsoft thinks is attractive to them within the LSE. And by the way, what he says to us is a very strong vindication of David Schwimmer and his predecessor's strategy for the LSE. Now, I also wanted to remind you that in addition to entering into the joint venture, Microsoft has also become a significant shareholder in the LSE. I think as it stands today, Microsoft is something like the sixth biggest shareholder in the London Stock Exchange Group. And I wanted to highlight that because to us, it seems to be part of an evident trend. And that trend is seeing US, but in some cases also global, seeing US investing institutions becoming bigger and bigger shareholders in winning UK companies, even if domestic UK investing institutions either can't or won't invest in those winning UK companies themselves. So for instance, I've mentioned both Relix and Experian. For both of those companies, the biggest active investor, the biggest active shareholder in both of those companies is a US institution, not a UK one. And just taking the next slide, just take a look at these two snapshots off Bloomberg of the top 10 shareholders of these two companies. First of all, the top 10 shareholders of Diageo, which like the LSE and Relex is a major, major shareholder, shareholding 
in Finsbury, but also the top 10 shareholders of Heineken. And I will just say here, Heineken is one of the three non-UK holdings that we have in Finsbury. Heineken's been a very, very long-standing investment for Finsbury. So when you look at Diageo's top 10 shareholders, it's very, very instructive to us to see that at number 10 is Berkshire Hathaway. Berkshire Hathaway, of course, Warren Buffett's vehicle. It looks to us as though Berkshire Hathaway has doubled its stake in Diageo sometime over the last six to nine months. And in a way, why would that be a surprise? Knowing what we know about Warren Buffett's predilections, of course, he would be interested in investing in a business that owns global brands as strong and ubiquitous as Diageo's. But I think what's also fascinating is to see that the ninth biggest shareholder in Diageo is Bill Gates, or at least Bill Gates's um, foundation. And I might also ask you to note that when you look at Heineken's um, top 10 shareholders, you will also see, and this is a 2023 event, that Bill Gates has become a top four or top five holder in that company as well. Now, we assume, and I think fairly, that Bill Gates gets to see as many new technology opportunities as he wants. And I'm sure he acts on a significant number of those new technology ideas. And yet, to us, it's so... <laughs> It's sort of comforting and exciting to see that he's also chosen for his own wealth or his family's wealth to commit such significant sums of capital to the owners of, well, such venerable beverage brands as those owned by Diageo and Heineken. And I think that the next slide almost certainly explains why <laughs> Gates might be attracted to, to invest in, in, in such brands. This is a slide um, that I'm grateful for. It was, um, it was actually sent to me by a Finsbury shareholder. That's Gillen and Co., uh, an Irish uh, wealth manager. And what the slide shows, as you can see, is the price of a pint of plain, a pint of Guinness. And I know I don't need to reinforce this, but to remind you, Guinness is the second biggest brand owned by Diageo. The price of a pint of plain compared to the gold price and taken back to 1900. And as you can see, the price of a pint of the black stuff has very significantly exceeded the gold price over that period. And in particular, you can see the inflection of the price of a pint of Guinness when inflation really got going in the 20th century in the 1970s. And what that means, what that means is that the owner of Guinness, a strategic long-term owner of Guinness, has almost certainly, almost certainly protected the value of their investment over time against the malign effects of monetary inflation. And to us, it's so instructive and such an important investment lesson to note how many 
enduring family fortunes around the world are based upon the ownership of beloved beverage brands. And I have to say, just monitoring the business performance over the last 18 months, this period of rising input costs, monitoring the business performance of a Diageo, of a Heineken, uh, even of a, a, an AG Bar, uh, the owner of Iron Brew, which is another Finsbury portfolio of holding, it's been so reassuring to see those companies be able to protect us and our clients against the effects of in inflation by flexing the pricing power of these incredible brands that they own. I will just put a full stop to this discussion about beverages, but let me just say this. Roughly a quarter, 25% of Finsbury's NAV is invested in these semi-eternal, strongly price-powered be beverage brands. So uh, I'd like to look at another uh, brand, moving on to the next slide. Um, another brand that we expect has got meaningful pricing power, uh, and it's Burberry. Um, again, a major shareholding in Finsbury, just around 10% of NAV currently. And I think it's so important to make the claim that Burberry is a rare and highly valuable asset. Burberry is one of the world's relatively few true global luxury brands. You probably know this, but there is a marketing agency called Interbrand, and every year Interbrand produces its list of the 100 most valuable brands of all types, the 100 most valuable brands in the world, according to it, Interbrand's calculations. And last year, there were eight luxury goods brands within that top 100. And I have to tell you, Burberry was one of them. I acknowledge Burberry was the eighth <laughs> in value out of the octet, but nonetheless, it was firmly within that elite collection of global luxury brands. And let's just think about the value that owning a heritage rich luxury brand can bring for you. Uh, and first of all, just going back to the beverage point, just think about the long term pricing power that these sorts of luxury franchises can offer. Gabardine was invented by Thomas Burberry back in, I think, 1879. And since then, Burberry has effectively owned the top end luxury outerwear segment. We're showing you here, just as a reminder, the reason why trench coats are called trench coats. Here's one of our brave, brave boys modeling a Burberry trench coat back in 1916. But just look at the incredible pricing power exhibited by that trench coat over the next 100 years years. And if you're in any doubt whatsoever about the relevance of that for shareholders in a luxury company, again, I, I think investors have been in some ways irrationally negative about Burberry over the last few years, but it is what it is. But just remind yourselves, Burberry listed on the London Stock Exchange back in 2002 at a share price of roughly 
two pounds a share. Back then, Burberry's annual revenues were in the order of 500 million pounds a year. This year, 2023, Burberry's revenues will be more like three billion pounds. That's a six fold increase as Burberry has participated in this global secular trend for more and more consumer interest in and spending on luxury goods. And as you can see, the share price from two pounds, well, today it's trading around 25 pounds. And I, I don't know, I, I think I would say it's common sense. You know, it's common sense. Buy and hold the shares of great businesses, be patient, hold them over time, even if, even if those great businesses appear to be disadvantaged by having their listing on the London Stock Exchange. Now, I, I couldn't resist, this is kind of my final slide, I, I couldn't resist showing you these um, lovely quotations from the sainted nonagenarian um, Charlie Munger, soon to be, of course, a, uh, a centurion. He's 99. And both these quotes really resonated with me. I've mentioned the common sense of patiently owning stock in great businesses. I, I think it's useful to be reminded by Munger that common sense isn't necessarily as commonplace in our industry, as you might as you might think, a lot of smart people, uh, but sometimes perhaps too smart for their own good. And for me, as a history geek, I, I love reading this quote about the, you know, the really tangible monetary value of having an understanding of history industrial history, economic history, corporate history. And I would just say, I, I, you know, obviously time will tell, but, but I, I promise you that we look to bring that historical perspective to the structure. And I'm just going on now to the final slide again, showing Finsbury's portfolio. We look to bring that historical perspective to the structure of this Finsbury's investment portfolio. Um, with that, I'm just going to say sincerely, cordially, I look forward to repeating this video recording in another 22 years time, in 2045, when I'm confident we'll all be celebrating the wonderful wealth that's been created by this collection of companies. With that, thanks very much for your attention.